little blurb about Critical Digital Humanities Initiative, or CDHI. Uh, we are an institutional strategic initiative at the University of Toronto, and we emphasize questions of power, social justice, and critical theory in making and analyzing uh, digital technologies. We see our current historic shift in digital technology as an opportunity for political and social transformation. And we foreground creative praxis, co-creation, public engagement, and community-based research. We have been offering, we've, this is three years, uh, three years of funding. And during this period, we've been offering fellowships to graduate and undergraduate students. We host postdoctoral fellows. We have provided seed funding and other research support to faculty researchers and we provide training in critical DH methods and tools. And we host a wide variety of events, including our the talk that we are here for uh, today. Uh, so if you'd like to learn a little bit more about us, please check out our website at dhn.utoronto.ca. So please allow me to introduce um, the person who will be introducing our speaker today. And that is our wonderful colleague, Carl Knappett, uh, who is the Walter Graham Homer Thompson Chair in a GN Prehistory in the Department of Art History uh, at the University of Toronto. So over to you, Carl, if you could take it from here, that'd be great. Thank you. Great, yeah, sure. Thanks, Elspeth. I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure today to introduce Dr. Sean Graham, full professor in the Department of History at Carleton University in Ottawa. Uh, I know Professor Graham as an archaeologist and one of the earliest adopters of network analysis in archaeology in uh, the mid-2000s, um, applied chiefly to uh, Roman context. Uh, I've only very slowly realized myself that network approaches are a great example of the digital humanities. But Sean was onto this years ago and has worked tirelessly to open up from network analysis to a broader experimentation in the digital and computational uh, potential of archaeology. His blog, Electric Archaeology, was, as far as I'm aware, one of the first to present and discuss such concerns in the discipline, and it's still going strong. His research now goes beyond the confines of archaeology, diffusing into cultural heritage, for example, with his shirt project, the bone trade, studying the online trade in human remains with machine learning and neural networks. The creativity in his work is a wonderful example of the exploratory possibilities that DH holds. Uh, his work has been featured in the Ottawa Citizen, in Wired, and the New York Times. And in 2019, he won the AIA's award for outstanding work in digital archaeology for leading the creation of the open digital archaeology textbook environment. There are many other aspects um, concerning his achievements that I could list, um, but I think uh, we'll hand over straight away uh, to Dr. Graham for his talk, which will be on, uh, as you can see here, cultural heritage crime and neural networks, deformation for hot tips. Over to you, Sean, thank you. Uh, well, great, okay. So, uh, sure. Let me rearrange some stuff on my screen here because uh, my eyes aren't as good as they once were and it's kind of hard to read my text and my notes. And, and thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Carl, for the kind words. Um, it's been a long time since I started that blog. Um, and I was doing that when I was in the academic wilderness before I was formally in post anywhere but well after grad school. Um, so, so that blogging was part of the transformation or the, maybe the, the, the second real life grad school as it were for learning how to be this thing, the digital humanities, which I didn't even realize was a thing until I applied for the job at Carleton. They said, you can do DH. And I said, sure, I can do DH. And not knowing what that was, I had to go and figure it out. So my entire work since joining Carleton in 2010 has been trying to figure out, well, what the hang are digital humanities? What does it mean for me as an archaeologist to be doing DH, an archaeologist in a Canadian history department? 
Uh, a Roman archaeologist with a specialty in stamped Roman bricks from the first to third century upstream of Rome on the east bank in the Tiber Valley in the Sabina, a really pretty niche and largely useless specialty in Canadian archaeology. What, what was I supposed to do? So the years since then have been trying to figure that out. And that that initial exploration with networks that Carl mentioned has really, really steamrolled in, in recent years, especially realizing that networks can do computation in and of themselves. And, and so it, it's that aspect that has led to this work on uh, cultural heritage crime and has led to the work on the human remains trade and, and knowledge graphs in general. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I've already completely gone off track from my notes. Um, but I'm coming to you this morning, this morning, this afternoon, uh, in my basement. It's really hard to tell what time of day it is because it's dark down here. And I'm in Ottawa, and this is the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe. And, you know, when I think about land acknowledgements, it seems to me that if a, if a land acknowledgement made by me, a Roman archaeologist working in the living in the Ottawa Valley, for, for that to be meaningful, I think I need to be thinking about the way that what I study and how we study and the things that we explore, how they intersect with that land acknowledgement. So being largely a lapsed archaeologist who became DH partly out of the desperation of unemployment and, and one last kick at the, the academic can, I, I think that means for me trying to be open about the work, sharing the code, thinking about the impacts, wondering about the human in the digital humanities, right? Um, that might not be the best answer to the question, but it's the answer that I'm working with at the moment. So, you know, my interests in archaeology intersect with this fascination of the power of networks to represent information, to compute information, and to show us the gaps in the things we thought we already knew, right? To make things strange. That's what the deformation is. And archaeology, especially given its emergence as a tool of empire and a tool of colonization, it's really still at the beginning stages of gaining that humility to admit that we don't know things, that there might be other powerful ways of knowing. So a land acknowledgement, to my mind, challenges us to look around us with new eyes and to have that humility. So my goal for us today um, is to introduce you to knowledge graph embeddings, the, the technique of it and, and sort of the high level discussion of what they do, uh, and to walk you through how my grad students and my colleagues and I have been using them to deform and see our topics with fresh eyes. So the domain we're exploring is cultural heritage crime. The game is afoot. Okay, that was a bad, you know, I'm trying here, Sherlock Holmes. So the problem with cultural heritage crime, right? Here's an empty field. You can look at that and you see there's, there's a lighter kind of square in the middle with darker edges around it. It's a bit of a crop mark, right? Archaeologists read that landscape and they're looking for hints of what lies beneath. But... You know, I, I worked in Italy, and in Italy, there's folks that we call tomboroli. So these are the folks who who know better than the archaeologists. They know what's underneath far better than than the academic archaeologists because they walk that land every day, and what they're after, you know, is treating those resources, that heritage under the ground, as something that, you know, this is our land. I will dig this, and maybe I can sell this. It is something for me to, to work with. But they don't get much money for their troubles. They might find an ancient grave. They might loot it. They might sell it to a middleman for a handful of, of dollars, as it were. That middleman will sell it further up the chain. And eventually those artifacts, that cultural heritage, will turn up in a museum or in somebody's collection and you can be guaranteed that the person at the very top of that chain has paid a hell of a lot more money than that Tomborolo did when they first excavated, right? So those chains, um, 
I taught a class on the antiquities trade a number of years ago, which is what prompt started me down this, this particular path. And I wanted to understand more about those chains, that that distance between when the the gentleman, you know, goes out in the field at night with his, you know, sons or brothers, whatever, and, and digs something up and it turning up in Sotheby's, turning up at Christie's, turning up at the Met, turning up wherever. Right. I want to know. I wanted to know. I wanted to explore. Is it possible? Can I take these chains and the little links that we do see and somehow extrapolate from the things we know to the things that we don't know? So I want to give you a, a, a real great example of these chains in action. Right. Uh, in 94, this is the castle at Melfi in Italy. It was robbed. Uh, armed gang broke in one night tied up the guards, stole a number of Greek vases, amongst other things. And months later, those vases turned up in the home of a dealer in Germany who was already under surveillance for other things. So a police search of that property found artifacts in the process of being made ready for sale. Um, that can be cleaning, that can be putting together, that can also mean breaking because sometimes you can get more money out of the fragments than the entire pot. So there was a whole little workshop going on here. And they found some documents, <laughs> bills of sale. And this gave them the names of two men in Italy whom they put under surveillance. And one of these Italian men had been a policeman himself at one point. His name was Pasquale Camara. And the Carabinieri, the federal Italian police, put him under surveillance. And one day Camara was out, he, he was on his way to visit a known antiquities dealer, which was why he was being followed. And on the way, he crashed his car and was killed. And the Carabinieri, as they went through the wreckage, trying to reconstruct what had happened, they found antiquities in the wreckage, which gave them just cause or due cause, whatever the technical word is, to, to go and examine Camara's apartment in Rome. And there they found hundreds of artifacts, some real, some fake, photographs of artifacts at every stage in the process being pulled out of the ground, being readied for sale, and more documents. And this time with names of, of people in the chain of connections, including a, a gentleman named Danilo Tsiki. When they searched Tsiki's apartment, they found a diagram drawn by Camara showing his best understanding of how the entire Italian antiquities trade was organized from the lowest levels right up to the top. This is called the organogram. And this blew this investigation wide open and it led to more investigations and more arrests. And of course, you know, coming from a network background, I'm like, holy smokes, this is a network. What can I do with this stuff? And I wanted to know if I took these connections as a starting point and would there be a way of uncovering connections we don't know about? So we pitched to Shirk and said, we'd like to have an insight development grant, please. Uh, and we called it the new organogram project. And we said, we're gonna use, uh, gonna use the magic of digital computing to, to fill in the, uh, the gaps. So magical digital pixie fairy dust. And Shirk said, yes, please. And you know what? It turns out the too long didn't read, you can. Uh, so you can, you've got other things to do. You can leave now because I've given you the answer, but now I'm going to give you the details. Yes, we can, but to do it, you have to forget what we know and deform the things that we do know. So this project is with uh, Donna Yates at the University of Maastricht. Uh, I can never say that university's name correctly, but the one in Holland. Uh, and Donna Yates might be familiar to people as... Um, uh, uh, one of the world's leading experts in heritage crime and uh, the intersection of criminology with archaeology and antiquities trading. So I, I'm really, really grateful to Donna for putting up with me. So let's talk provenance research for a moment. Okay, so we're going to get into the networks, but we, I want to, I want to just give you a contrast of what we're doing with the ways that people typically try to fill in these gaps, right? So there's two approaches generally. There's a there's a reactive object-oriented kind of approach where the provenance curator, the curator in general, is gonna pay attention to those objects most likely to cause trouble, right? Um, 
the Persepolis, uh, the freezes, the guard freezes uh, from Persepolis, the one turned up in a museum in Montreal in 2011, was stolen, turned up in a guy's apartment in Edmonton. Um, there are a number of these. So, I mean, you're a curator, you've got one of these, you should know that it's going to be a problem. Uh, you know that paintings with murky provenances in the 30s and 40s are going to be problematic. You know that uh, Greek antiquities that pass through the hands of certain dealers are going to be a problem. So as a museum person, you focus on those ones that you know are going to be problematic. The other way, uh, painting broadly here, is to think of objects as part of a diaspora coming from uh, assemblages in the first place and draw connections between objects across and through institutions. But that is hard because of institutional inertia, or the problems of data sharing across silos, and maybe a perception that that work takes more energy when we know we've got all of this stuff with dodgy European provenances from the 1930s and 40s that we've got to deal with, right? So the problem with investigating cultural heritage crime from that object-centered approach is that we're tending to see these things through a mirror poorly, a shattered mirror. We're seeing reflections and shards that of the things that we set out to see. You know, museums have priorities, but those for particular objects, but those priorities are already based on what we think we know, right? We think we know about the problems of World War II materials. So if we focus on the familiar problems and the familiar kinds of crimes that lead to this material turning up in museums or on the art market or in collections, we're going to find the same familiar relationships and the same familiar object pathways. In archaeology, what you believe before you start is going to guarantee what it is you find, right? If you can't see, um, you know, for, for years in archaeology, children were absent from the archaeological record. Women were absent from the archaeological record because the guys doing the archaeology, bald white guys who never had thought about this sort of thing. So they didn't find it because they didn't know to, their blinders were on and couldn't see it. So what you believe has an impact on what you're gonna find, right? So in terms of heritage crime, there are other kinds of crimes that we might encounter. You know, um, museums and objects and collections might have key roles in fraud, uh, tax evasion, money laundering. We know these things happen. And we know that antiquities are a major part of that, but focusing on an object biography approach sometimes might only show us those things that we already expect to find. So how do you change that? How do you take your blinders off? Well, this is where the deformation part comes into it. If you come to DH from a English or a literary background, you might be familiar with Samuels and McGann and their paper on deformation from the from 99, I think it was, you know, reading poetry backwards against the grain or, uh, Mark Sample has this wonderful blog post from 2011 on uh, towards a deformed digital humanities, where he talks about the beauty of, of looking at the deformations. Um, in archaeology, you want to understand about ceramics and pottery, you find more from the broken edges than you do from the pot, right? You can see into the fabric, you can understand things about how the, the pottery was made. It's not an exact analogy, but I'm trying here. Well, we're, we're not trying to break things, but we are trying to do is take the things that we do know about the antiquities trade, deform it with the neural networks and see it with fresh eyes in a way that we haven't done before. So it's making sense so far, I hope. This is where things get computational. And there are a couple of bits and pieces I think that I ought to um, pull together at this point. And, you know, Ultimately, these techniques, word embeddings and vectors and knowledge graphs and knowledge graph embedding models and the neural networks that make that possible, they're all just more and more sophisticated or complicated expressions of the idea that if we have a document in front of us and we count up all the words and how many times they turn up and how many times they turn up in different kinds of contexts or assemblages of words across documents, you know, just a whole lot of counting, we will see patterns that are meaningful. And it's amazing how much of DH boils down to sophisticated counting. So word embeddings, right? 
so this is the first piece of the, the Lego puzzle, the Lego edifice that I'm building here. So the idea of word embeddings is that uh, it captures the idea that a word can actually be thought of as a look as having a location and a and a direction in semantic space. Um, we're used to thinking about geographic space in terms of latitude and longitude. Well, latitude and longitude is a two-dimensional vector, right? It's a list of two numbers that tell us a point in space. So if I know the vector for Ottawa, the latitude and the longitude, and I know the vector for Toronto, um, I can measure mathematically the distance between those two points in geographic space and know something about the relationship between Ottawa and Toronto. I could add more information, you know, maybe a third number in my vector, a three-dimensional vector, maybe altitude. And that would tell me more about that relationship. I could add a fourth vector and have it be, uh, I don't know, games one for Ottawa Senators, games one for Toronto Maple Leafs, and have a, a four-dimensional vector. Um, I don't know what that particular vector would tell me, but it would tell me something. So if we can accept that semantic space can be thought of as a kind of geographic space, then we can start doing some really funky things. So the techniques of word embeddings take all of the words in a corpus, in a document, and express it into a space. And then it's a hugely multi-dimensional space and we can't really conceptualize it. So there are other techniques to reduce it down to two or three dimensions where it kind of makes visual space to us. And then it just becomes relatively simple math to measure proximity in that space. So you represent your words as a vector. It, the vector could be as long as the vocabulary of all your documents and then ones and zeros represent when a word is present or when it's not. But there are more efficient ways of doing this. And it turns out that neural network architectures, which are just layers of computational functions that pass information from one level to the next uh, if it passes a threshold and then a whole bunch of feedback loops. It turns out that neural networks are really good for doing this kind of work, tokenizing, counting word co-occurrences, cooking up the matrix, and then representing the relationships through the similarity of their vectors. And then you can start doing really interesting things like semantic analogies, right? Uh, and the one that everybody always, that you see reproduced in any article that talks about this is where king minus woman equals queen, right? You take the vector for king, you delete the vector for, or you add the vector for woman, sorry, um, you get something that's very close to the vector for queen. Uh, word embeddings reveal our biases. And Ben Schmidt has used word vectors on student evaluations of male and female professors to show how words that are doing um, roughly the same semantic work are, are gendered. So you end up with male professors being always called genius in certain contexts and women professors always being called quirky in certain contexts. So these, these word vectors can reveal um, lots of things going on. Word embeddings are amazing. You can look at word embeddings and corpuses over time and see how, how meanings have changed, right? Uh, which is what this um, illustration is, is gesturing towards here. I don't know about statistical laws of semantic change, but it's an interesting uh, illustration showing how word meaning changes. We know a word by the company it keeps, I think is the, the pithy phrase. In a different project, in our bone trade project, we took uh, thousands, tens of thousands of posts related to human remains trade on Instagram and dropped all of that material through a word embedding model. Then we could do things like, okay, I, the word is good, the word is bad, Let's draw a line between those two and see which words are closest to good, which words are closest to bad. And we can take another, create another vector, another uh, horizon from uh, things for, for the word for sale to not for sale, cross those two vectors. And then we started understanding something about value judgments, you know, what constitutes interesting 
human remains for sale to the people who do the human remains trade. So uh, human remains trade is not the, the focus here today, but just showing that word embeddings alone can really start showing some powerful things. So you can do word embeddings at the level of the individual word, a paragraph, a document. Why not a knowledge graph? So a knowledge graph is a network of statements. We, we, we have a series of, of statements. George works for ACME. Uh, Mike, friends with George. Subject, verb, object, or subject, predicate, object. And when we take a knowledge graph and create this kind of embedding model from it, it captures the semantics of the knowledge graph in the same way that allow us to find other statements or individuals within our graph that are participating in similar kinds of discourses. Okay, so the, the tool that we use, I'm gonna, I'm, I know that was kind of uh, short, but I'm gonna explain more, but Amplograph is the package that we've been using. Um, the complex model works best for us. Um, and I think I'll just, sorry, my, I, I managed to put things a little bit out of order. How do you friggin' well get a knowledge graph in the first place? We wanted true statements. We wanted, we said, okay, if we're going to take the antiquities trade and we're going to try and, um, we're, we're, we're going to try to find those gaps and understand something true about them, we got to start with what we know. So we, we set up the inception annotation platform and my students started manually going through the 130 articles from the Traffic and Culture Encyclopedia, dragging subjects onto objects and indicating what the verb or what the predicate was. We ex export all of that and that gives us our knowledge graph. And so we end up with things, uh, triplets, Giacomo Medici sold to Robert Hack. And we end up with 1,200 statements, about almost 500 distinct entities using 81 unique verbs derived from this antiquities uh, encyclopedia. So we, we've done a radical condensation of that knowledge. And when you stitch those statements together, you end up with the knowledge graph. Now, you can represent that knowledge graph as just a straight up regular network, which is what this is. And this is kind of a check on, um, does this make sense yet, right? So when we, we expressed all of that knowledge as, as a regular ordinary network, we see, you know, Giacomo Medici turns up, Sotheby's, Robert Olson, uh, Leonardo Patterson. There's all this empty space though in this network. The thing about a network graph like this, a force gravity algorithm, is that all that white space there, all that empty terra incognita, that, that, that's meaningless. There's no semantic meaning to that. It's just a, a random kind of, of layout. But you can see there's all sorts of little clumps of statements floating around. So there's we, we want to bridge those gaps. If we wanted to do regular network analysis on this, we would have to transform this into a series of one mode networks. Right now, this is a multi-mode network with 80, what did I say, 81 different verbs? So you would have to transform that into 81 separate um, networks, which would be doable, but it wouldn't help too much. But if we take these statements and progress, project them into an embedding space, just as one would create an embedding model of the words in a corpus of text to see how things cluster. We can do that, and we can do that kind of semantic algebra that I mentioned earlier, and you end up with the ability to start predicting the likely gaps, the likely connections here. So you see uh, between Acme and, and Liverpool. Is this making sense? Because sometimes I uh, get ahead of myself and get excited about things. 
Okay. So we start with those encyclopedia articles. We condense them down to series of knowledge triplets. We turn those triplets into a graph. We take that graph and drop it through a neural network to turn it into uh, an embedding model to treat the triplets as um, uh, it, like the same way we would do with word embeddings. And now, now the fun begins. My version of fun, which might not be the same as yours. But say you know that Giacomo Medici sold antiquities to Robert Hecht. Well, you can find where that idea exists in that embedding space. And then with a bit of geometry, a bit of trigonometry, you can find other people who told who had similar relationships with Robert Hecht and other dealers turning up in that same vague space. And so what Appligraph does is it takes those true statements and it starts doing a ranking by taking the, the, the entities that we know and creating false statements from that. So a false statement for Ampligraph is one that isn't in the original knowledge graph, but uses the entities or the relationships in that knowledge graph. And it uses that difference to start ranking and start evaluating things. So now we can start testing new ideas. We can say, hey, there, model. Um, I have a suspicion that Giacomo Medici sold antiquities to Mary and True. What's the likelihood of that? So it takes those new statements and drops them through that same model and using that same corrupting strategy to give a sense for a given probability. And it feels that Medici and Mary and True probably have a really strong relationship. We're not treating these things as true. These, these statements are hypotheses. These probabilities are simply a mathematical function of where things exist in this multidimensional embedding space. We can't treat results as being true unless we could confirm them to the status of evidentiary proof, right? We can't do that. But some of these statements are so obviously true or likely to be true that they're of no use to us, right? They aren't deforming the things that we already know. And some statements are going to be so unlikely that anybody with knowledge of the domain can discard them. So what's left is an interesting possible middle space where it is giving us relationships that we didn't previously have reason to suspect, but can't immediately rule out. And this is where Donna's expert knowledge really comes to the fore. I, I, um, I hammer things together in a kind of digital bricolage. That's that's my forte. Uh, Donna's the the cultural heritage crime guru, and we look at these statements and we say, ah, okay, that one that one is curious, and that's our hot tip. You know, and numbers and probabilities and stuff are are handy, but sometimes valuable insight can emerge from the visualization. This is a hugely multi dimensional space, and it's hard to get our heads around it, but there are techniques for reducing that to two or three uh, dimensions. In that network visualization I showed you, blank spaces or clustered spaces didn't carry any semantic meaning. It's just the force gravity algorithm at work. But when we visualize the embedding model, well, now proximity and blank space is meaningful. So, you know, if someone in South America who similarly bought and sold antiquities to a, a person who then sold antiquities at auction in California, well, that similarity, right, gets captured by the embedding model and that pattern would project those folks into similar kinds of spaces. So I want to take you through just one of the insights that this provided. In fact, this is the first one. So it's the, the, the case of Leonardo Patterson in the Brooklyn Museum. So this dreadful diagram is one of, the, one of the very first visualizations that the embedding model pulled together. And it's been flattened from uh, 400 degrees, 400 dimensions down to two. And you can see here's Giacomo Medici. We know a lot about Giacomo Medici. So Giacomo Medici ends up kind of being our baseline. 
we, um, we look at Giacomo here in, in the bottom right hand panel, and we see all of these individuals who are appearing in very close proximity to them, which implies that there's a meaningful connection between them. And we can measure the cosine distance between these, um, these people around Giacomo. And we took that cosine distance as kind of our benchmark said, we know Giacomo Medici has all of these connections, and this is how close he is in our model. If we find other pairs of interesting people elsewhere in the model who are closer than that distance, we'll investigate them. And that's where um, we get this really interesting Leonardo Patterson and the Brooklyn Museum coming together. And Donna looked at that and said, well, that doesn't make any sense. Leonardo Patterson has no connection with the Brooklyn Museum. Why is it telling us that? Well, this is Leonardo Patterson. He's made a career out of selling real antiquities and fake antiquities uh, from Central and South America. And when he sells the fake antiquities, like they're audaciously fake. He's been convicted in several countries. He's had criminal charges in other countries. He's had civil judgments in more countries. But he always kind of, the wave passes and he's still on the surface paddling furiously. And sometimes it seemed over the last 50 years, he's often had more money than he should, given what is known. And other times, periods of financial distress. And Donna said, it, it's, it's a weird connection for this model to suggest, but he's the kind of person who might be involved in different kinds of crime beyond merely selling antiquities. So we decided to check it in. This was the first hot tip from the model. And this completely upended our research agenda for months that we spent chasing this down because it turned out to be really pretty cool. Um, so what is the connection? Well, the Brooklyn Museum, it's in New York and Patterson operated out of New York from time to time. So there could be a geographical connection. But we do know that over the years in the 20th century, the Brooklyn Museum has had antiquities that have had dodgy origins. In 1964, they purchased and then had to return in 1972 portions of Amaya Stila from Guatemala from the site of Piedras Negras. Um, so South America, that, okay, Patterson definitely operated out of South America. So Donna went to the collections database uh, for the Brooklyn Museum and searched Leonardo Patterson. And four minutes later, we had a hit. It turns out that Patterson donated low value uh, objects in the late sixties. So Donna wrote to the museum and said, uh, do you know anything more about this? And they said, well, funny you should mention that. Um, one of these objects has just appeared in a special exhibit. So we started looking into it. And then we realized this Patterson character is kind of uh, a well-known problem. Uh, and we had flagged it for further investigation, but it wasn't really high up on our priority list. But now that you folks have reached out to us, we're going to move this up a lot higher on our priorities. So we could have left things there. We had we had the model, it suggested a connection, the connection seems kind of odd, but it checked out in the real world. The model suggested it had a good probability. Lo and behold, we found something. The model suggests this based on the semantic space of other things that it knew, and that put Leonardo in the same kind of space as other people uh, operating in the, the the kind of New Yorkish area, not because of their geography, but because of their pattern of behavior, because of the pattern of things that we knew. But wait, there's more. It gets better. The only other time that we knew of that Patterson donated material was part of a tax scam in 1979 in Australia. He arranged a donation to the National Gallery of Victoria that took a, uh, advantage of a big loophole he imported a whole bunch of antiquities to Australia and sold them to a group of investors for a million dollars. They turned around and had those pieces evaluated at $4 million, courtesy of a supplier that 
Patterson provided, which they then donated for inflated tax relief. They didn't break the law, but they certainly broke the, the intent of the law, which undermines public trust. And it was a bit of a scandal, and all that Australia could do at the time was to close the loophole. So why is he donating these low-value things to Brooklyn when the only other time we've encountered him doing this was when he pulled off the big scam in, in 79 Australia? Well, we started looking elsewhere, and we started finding Patterson donations in other museums, which was easy to look for once we knew that we should look. But until we were prompted by the model, no one ever had. And we've now found Patterson donations in six museums in three countries over three decades. And it's kind of odd. The key to making sense of it turns out to be a set of human teeth. In 84, Patterson made a donation of human teeth from Chiapas, that had jade and plaster inlaid in them, and he gave them to the British Museum. Uh, the British Museum doesn't have much documentation related to this donation, but what they do have still in their archive is um, uh, there's a report to the museum trustees in 84 mentioning the donation and a pro forma letter of thanks sent by the museum to Patterson. But that letter got returned, no, uh, got returned to the British Museum because there was nobody in New York to receive it, nobody at this address. Well, it turns out that in 1984, at the same month that the donation was made to the museum, he was arrested on wire fraud charges uh, in the US for trying to pull off the sale of fake ancient Maya murals. So he wasn't at his regular address as he was the guest of Uncle Sam. The, our suspicion is that the whole point of giving the teeth to the museum, to the British Museum, was to get that letter to support the fraudulent sale of the murals making the British Museum one element in a transnational scheme to defraud the US, right? If he hadn't been arrested and missed his mail, he would have had that letter from the BM with the BM letterhead saying, dear Mr. Patterson, thank you so much for your gift, right? A tangible token of his legitimacy to potential buyers. Um, you can see where that would be really helpful when you're gonna scam someone. We think that Patterson would have gotten similar acknowledgements or receipts of his gifts to other museums. And these things would have also turned up in annual reports. So this one tip from our model seems to have uncovered the way that Patterson laundered his reputation, created his legend, creates his bona fides, makes a name for himself as an antiquities dealer so he can make the big scores later on. Which is pretty cool. I think you'll agree. At least I hope you'll agree. Um, so that was just one tip. And there's a lot more things that we could add to our embedding not model. We started with 129 articles. There are court dockets. There are the Panama Papers. There are newspaper articles. There are other academic works that could all take these things that we know deform them through the neural network, deform them through word vectors and embeddings. But it is a really unpleasant task to annotate these documents, to get that knowledge graph in the first place. It kind of seems like a poor use of human resources in the year 2024. So like everybody else, I've spent the last few months farting around with large language models. Um, you know, Large language models in this case are useful because the one thing that everybody agrees that they do well is they model language. And if you have a good model of how the English language works, it becomes fairly easy to summarize things, right? So large language models are good because they are models of word use. Um, and their architecture goes back to the use of neural networks to facilitate translation from one language to another. So what we're going to ask them, what we've been asking them to do is to take all of these vast amounts of other data that we have and do a combination of summarization and translation to the key ideas in the source document, okay? Um, I don't think I'll bother explaining more about how large language models work, but if you, uh, if you develop the prompt very carefully, we can take these 
uh, documents, the true things we know about the antiquities trade, drop it through a large language model and end up with a condensation, a summarization of that article in a series of triplets. And that is incredibly powerful. I mean, Carl, there's no reason why you couldn't use this on old excavation archives, right? To, to pull out interesting things. So how do we do it? Well, here is, uh, as of last fall, this is the prompt that worked best for us. And it, it seems kind of odd because what you're trying to do is you're trying to steer that language model to the space of its training, which involves the entire internet, where people have summarized documents in JSON format. And of course, large language models are known for hallucinating and making stuff up. And that's because they aren't intelligent. They are models of language and fundamentally of what letter comes next. So you have to steer it very carefully so that when it chooses that next letter that comes next, it's choosing it from the document that you've fed it to. And that's what this prompt is attempting to do. And if you're familiar with the Vinyl Cafe, you will recognize some of the characters in here. As far as I know, Sturt McLean never wrote a Vinyl Cafe story where uh, Mary Turlington, Kenny Wong, or Dave embarked on a life of art crime. So I use them as my example for what I'm after out of my documents. And if the LLM hallucinates or it keeps adding characters after I want it to stop, it's going to add characters from the Vinyl Cafe, which makes it a hell of a lot easier to go through and find the results and um, see things. I, I kind of imagine in my mind that people are either smiling, laughing, or rolling their eyes, um, if I could but see you. But you know what? It took three or four months of work annotating those 129 articles by hand to get that first knowledge graph. Once I figured out this prompt, which took me a day or two of playing, uh, it took about three hours and cost me maybe $50 to end up with a knowledge graph, which I then compared head to head with the original one that I'd done, that we had done by hand. And there are metrics that you can calculate to get a sense of how well your knowledge graph is performing as an embedding model. And yeah, the model that I built using the LLM is not as good as the manual model. But damn, it was fast. So I ran the, the same predictions and it, it pulled out that Leonardo Patterson Brooklyn Museum as one of its top things again. It's predictions, it's the shape of its embedding space was very similar. And the difference between the two models, the trade-off of speed, and the ability to then take this same prompt and add more data to it is, is worth the trade-off. But one thing that was interesting was that it suggested a new lead that also seemed unlikely again. But because the in the, the second model, the cosine distance was still much closer than that for our Giacomo Medici baseline, we thought we'd check it out. And it was for the dealer Ed, Edward Marin and the American Natural History Museum. This seemed unlikely, but then we started seeing all these interesting parallels. He's donating to the same museums that Patterson did. He's donating at the same time frame that Patterson did. He's donating the exact same kinds of objects that Patterson did. So it kind of feels like there's a pattern emerging. He's donating to museums in Australia at the same time that Patterson did. We've never had any evidence of a direct connection between Edward Marin and Leonardo Patterson, but suddenly prompted by our hot tip, there seems to be something going on. So the plot thickens. So to start winding this all up, this is typically the point where somebody would say, well, yeah, couldn't you have found that all right? Couldn't you have found that all out? Even if you hadn't had this model, couldn't you have just simply done the legwork? Um, the same pattern of unexplained museum donations without all of this computational stuff? And of, of course, yes, 
Yes, we could have, if we had known to look, if we had known where to look. But the point is, over the last 50 years, no one ever has. In over five decades since Patterson made that first donation that we've noticed, uh, despite his infamy, no one ever noticed it. The model deformed the things that we knew about the antiquities trade and presented it to us, prompting us to ask different questions, looking at the material with fresh eyes. We're not saying that other researchers could not have noticed, but we are saying, well, nobody did. Now, is this actionable intelligence? Is this stuff that an investigation could use? Well, I'm not a lawyer, and this is all pretty circumstantial. So no, not in a legal sense. But this model, this whole approach gives us new lens to look at information that we do have, to consider things we do know, and to see it in a new light. Um, every time I pull the lever on this wonderful machine, computational machine, it comes up with new suggestions. It reinforces older suggestions that it's already made. It's giving us or helping us set the agenda for where we will spend our attention. It seems like a pretty good DH outcome to my mind. So that's the big ticket idea of this talk here today. Uh, what's next? We, all, we want more data, obviously. Uh, the problem is the information in other data sets, newspaper articles, so on, might not be accurate or truthful. So we have to figure out a way of dealing with that kind of data. Um, GPT and language models and open access language models are getting more and more powerful. And it's good to not use the models that come from the big commercial vendors because Lord only knows what happens with the, the information that they, they learn when you use those things. So uh, looking at museum provenance data sets, different things like that. I just, this morning for giggles, I took our original knowledge graph and augmented it with 3,000 newspaper articles and ran it through the whole system again, uh, finding uh, new and interesting things to look at. I've been trying to do, you know, that old Star Trek dream computer. Tell me about Leonardo Patterson and possible connections he might have with the Brooklyn Museum. Um, by taking the, uh, the original data set, right? So, Large language models can make really handy chat interfaces, natural language interfaces for your data. You take your original documents, drop those through a vector database, an embedding model. You type in your, your query. Tell me about the modus operandi of Douglas Latchford. It turns that into a vector. It compares the vectors and says, okay, these documents are probably germane to that question feeds the question and those documents to the large language model, which then produces a summary and a written uh, outcome. That's kind of powerful. But if you take that approach and also weld a knowledge graph embedding model on top of that, you get even better results. At least I think you should. This is something that I'm farting around with now. The idea is that I want to be able to generate hypotheticals and quickly find interesting leads in the supporting information in a way that I can you better use my research assistant's time than getting them to fight with Python. Maybe it's a foolish errand, but I thought I would give it a try. And I've been trying other things like drawing ontologies by hand and turning those into descriptions and then giving that to GPT to develop better prompts that would then permit me to find and process more information. All of this is because we can use the neural network architecture to learn patterns of semantic similarity. It's just glorified counting, folks. That's DH, but it's opening up a whole world of possibilities. So thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you've enjoyed that and found it interesting. Um, I'm freewheeling off the top of my head. If you want the actual nitty gritty details, uh, these are our, our current outputs that will will explain it in a more coherent and uh, digestible fashion. So thank you. Thank you very, very much, Sean. That was fantastic. Um, I've got um, all kinds of questions 
myself um, and I'm sure others do. Um, just uh, before, you know, I'll just jump in and get the ball rolling. Um, slightly odd point maybe, but um, that I have, <laughs> but um, it, it, of course it makes absolute sense to uh, start with scenarios where uh, one's dealing with kind of clandestine networks, if I can put it like that, or or incomplete uh, or networks about which our information is very incomplete. We have scraps, and you know we we need help finding some some patterns. I, I guess the thought comes to me, which is maybe a bit silly, but what about um, and and there's much less motivation to do this. I get that, but what about starting with uh, scenarios which seem to have very complete information and like yeah. you wouldn't dream of doing this because like why would you but is it possible to sort of as an experiment do that and you know the the apparent completeness um you know the the damning evidence is maybe not what it seems i mean is that a, a crazy thing to <laughs> suggest yeah yeah no that's a really good question and i don't think it's a crazy thing to do at all because Part of the most powerful things that we've found so far in exploring this, this technology and this approach um, hasn't been necessarily asking it to complete the links across the, the gaping spaces, but just the visualization, just the clustering itself. So I can imagine if you took a, a network of, of knowledge of something that you knew quite well and it was more or less complete, seeing that embedding space visualized for you in two or three dimensions would still provide rich insight because it would be, it's a kind of clustering that that one mode or even two mode network analysis wouldn't give you because it's, it's taking into effect, it's taking into account also the semantic meaning of the relationships themselves and how those semantic relationships intersect. So I think it would be a valuable exercise. I think it would um I think it would show you something really cool. Hey, thanks. Thanks. My um, intuition so, is that it would. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh folks can certainly put um type questions into the chat. Um you can also uh put your hand up and then unmute. So I see uh, Michael Sinatra, would you like to that's a good question. Thanks. Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for the talk, Sean. That was, that was really fascinating. Um, I was wondering if you'd uh, taken into account questions of languages for some of the data that you feed the models and, and using, obviously, Italian newspaper would be one thing that I could think of, but trying to see whether there would be similar type of patterns or whether, the, the you know, sometimes the specificity of English is also its own, you know, bias in, in what it does. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the this is the big problem of multilingual DH that people like Quinn Dombrowski write about all the time. And right now, all of the material that we're using is in English. Um, I'm not, I haven't been mixing languages because I'm not sure how that would play out or what the confounding factors might be. So you're you're quite right. I mean, if um, I, it's a it's a good question, and it's not one that we've explored yet. Uh, I'm, I've mostly been focused on making this thing work and making sure that I'm pretty clear in my own head how it works and why it works. But it's it's a very good question to explore further. I'll, I'll just add, if you haven't seen recently, Paul Spence and some colleague did a really good uh, collection of essays on multilingual DH that came out about like two weeks ago or something like that. Oh. And there's some great essays about issues that come up with some of you know some of that topic so if you you know want to check that out uh and paul is obviously um you know at, at ucl and, and you know uh, uh, native speakers of spanish so he always has that you know interesting angle about uh about some of that language so there'll be suggestions for further reading for sure for sure maybe uh michael if you don't mind you could drop that into the chat and then other people could have that reference as well to to chase down but that's yeah So let me just quickly check the chat. Um, oh, Sean, I'm wondering, is it possible to stop the screen share and then we can see each other's faces? There we go. Yeah. There we go. Thank Sorry. you. No, it's okay. 
Okay, that's great. That's a bit easier for me to see if there's any hands up as well. Um, yeah, I, I guess uh, um, just just to sort of follow up on this kind of incompleteness sort of idea, and um, and you know, you said early on that the the sort of object centered approach is uh, is problematic. You know, if you sort of focus on the you know the the objects that are known, if you like, then we'll only ever find what we, you know, um, know to look for. Um, so, and, and I, I think you you mentioned it at a few other points as well. I mean, I wondered, I think my mind went towards ignoring antiquities altogether and thinking about, um, you know, just looking for fraud or, or something as, as, as the organizing principle and then assuming that there'll be antiquities there somewhere in, in the mix. Um, and, and I also wondered if, you know, net, network analysis or all of these techniques as, as structural, you know, um, analyses of some kind, um, you know, it, it, is there any sense of there being potentially a common structure in, in these kinds of illicit antiquities networks? of certain kinds of hierarchy or, or whatever, or, or cells, um, such that if you see it in one part of the world, you can kind of transport that structure to another part of the world and say, let's just say that the same kind of structure would likely be in place and let's use that when we have almost no information and see. Yeah. Um, well, there are there are folks like the Christos um, Siorogenis. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. has been taking that kind of networks and then those that kind of network modeling that people like Tom Bruhlins do for, for for modeling possible network structures that we don't have the information for which ones are most plausible I like there's a lot of work there I mean that's still a really rich area um this kind of marries that missing semantic element on top of that but it, it could well be as you describe yeah 